So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Research and Innovation Seminar organized on behalf of the Finesse Center for Smart Cities, Kalle Toiskallio and me, Matti Hämäläinen. Or the hosts, or the funny boys. Yeah, we're, we're the faces. We're not really organizing much of this, uh, but no. yeah, we're giving it a face. Uh, today's title is The Future Mobility piloting systemic change for commuters in urban traffic. And we have uh, three speakers presenting today and uh, two additional panelists joining in for, for the discussion. Yeah, welcome to everybody. And the audience, of course, is allowed to uh, comment in, in the end of the half of the session is supposed to be discussion and then very discussive discussion. Uh, and we have chat also, there, there is, that's one channel, perhaps more comfortable for, for persons who are not willing to speak out loud. Uh, about the background, uh, there is this Finnis Twins project, EU, EU project that has a task to put up a research and innovation center, or center of excellence as EU parlance uh, calls it, uh, uh, and, and, and the center is already, already there uh, and, and growing, Finnes Center for Smart Cities or Finnes Center among friends. Uh, and the whole, whole thing, um, this research and innovation um, uh, thing includes, of course, a lot of academic research, but then also uh, there is supposed to be a lot of innovation activities, applied activities, uh, and that's why we are today uh, discussing uh, about this uh, pilot project in Finnest Twins. We have at the moment four large scale pilots, something like 1,5 million uh, euros funding per each. Uh, and um, it's, it's always interesting to, to, to see what's, what's happening in the innovation side, although uh, these, these large scale pilots, these first four ones were we're organized very fast and, 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 and sort of, we're still learning. Uh, so they're very research intensive, which is of course a good thing uh, in the longer run, but, but they also, there should be lots of practical things, things happening. And this is one reason for this research and innovation seminars. Yes. As well, so that we try to get more interaction between the researchers and practitioners, whether they come from industry or from cities, city developers, uh, or uh, NGOs, for example. So we we tried to uh, engage uh, different participants from different sides into a dialogue, and hopefully that will lead into many practical applications for the research that is being being done. Yeah. Uh, for example, in these pilots. Yeah, large scale pilots are very different. They, they, some of them have not so much collaboration with with non academic parties, but this future mobility. Pilot is 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 very good example of, of having quite deep connections to to cities and 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 to companies. Uh, well, one one more uh, sort of angle is is in this Finnish Twins uh, project that uh, there is a, a deep urge to to create collaboration between Alta University and Taltec. Uh, and and also these large scale pilots are different in that sense that some of them don't have very very much uh, collaboration over the Gulf of Finland and and I think it's 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 a bit well in this future mobility uh, case is is also an example of, of, of that so so it's very much Taltec uh, project so that, that that's why we're very happy to have Villa Kurki here as a as a commentator from from Aalto University he's not part of of the the, the Finnish Twins project but but we we try to create this kind of connection so hopefully we will have great great discussions do we have Ville Kurki yes yes he arrived all oh, right great welcome Ville um, what else I think we, we like to talk but we should yeah. shut up Right. And so, mm. now that the audience is, is here, uh, also for the audience, please feel free to use the chat if you have any comments or questions in your mind. Uh, our studio director, Michelle, here will be monitoring those and, and picking up good ones for us to take into the discussion. 
Mm. So use, mm. use the chat for any questions or comments, and we'll try to incorporate those into the mm. discussion. And the whole, whole, whole session will be recorded. Uh, it will be available quite soon in the YouTube channel. So whatever you say, it will be there eternally. Right, right. Should we get started? Yes. So we have uh, the, the sort of structure of, of these three sessions is, is always similar that the professor or, or, or whoever uh, senior person will give very short introduction. Uh, and, and this time we, we have Raivosel, professor of, of uh, robotics from Taltec. Uh, and, and, and then uh, two more, uh, more detailed presentations uh, uh, from Andrew and, and then, then from Mosen, uh, and then we will discuss. Hopefully we don't need to participate a lot to, to the discussion so, so that you will, you specialist will, 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 will run the show mostly. Uh, yes, so, so uh, Raivo, so please take, not the floor, but screen. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, um... Yes, good morning, everyone. And, and uh, as I already introduced, I'm gonna just very briefly uh, introduce our large scale pilot, which is Future Mobility in short. Uh, and it's uh, coordinated by our research group, uh, Autonomous Vehicles in Taltec. Uh, and yes, we have also a partner from Alto, uh, uh, from Department of uh, Transportation. However, we're very open to, to expand the collaboration with other researchers, professors, and, uh, and groups in Alto. So would be really, really happy if this can initiate some new collaboration. Um, okay, but um, let's, let's come to the topic. So <clears throat> um, many of you probably know that this uh, large-scale pilot were um, initiated by the um, local governments uh, who identified different problems and, and we then as a, as a research group um, offered uh, some solution and, and initially uh, there was picked for, for large-scale pilot and, and uh, the issues what the local governments uh, identified in, in the transportation uh, are listed here uh, and I, was, I believe it's, it's rather universal not, not Estonian specific but it's uh, it's rather similar in other cities as well. Some of them are very, very likely more advanced, but somehow different issues, but still the, the connections and, and the public transport in general is, is not using its, its full potential and, and quite often not very comfortable for the person. So it has fixed lines and, and so on. So that's, uh, that's the issue we are trying to solve somehow uh, in terms of research and also in, in practical way. Um, and yes, we have very many different transportation, public transportation and, and other uh, uh, services. It's connected uh, the ticketing um, and all other uh, kind of uh, functions and, and uh, uh, yeah, services. So it, uh, right now the, the, the mobility as a service is coming uh, coming to kind of uh, unify or, or bring uh, different uh, transportation uh, means together. And in addition, we also have a different new means of transport. Uh, the micro mobility is uh, quite booming. Uh, and of course, uh, our focus as a, as a self-driving vehicles and, and in case of public transport, uh, the self-driving uh, shuttle uh, buses uh, uh, Probably the first uh, kind of um, vehicles it's coming to the uh, offering the real service. Um, so that's the kind of background, and, uh, and of course there are also some mega trends enabling all, all these, uh, um, let's say, situation or, or uh, mobility as a service uh, developments, um, and uh, that's all affecting also our developments like automated driving, of course, electrification, connectivity. Um, and, uh, and it's also very, very much connected with cybersecurity, which is the rising uh, topic. Uh, safety is the main concern to, to bring these vehicles uh, to the roads and, and all, all other aspects. So to jump to our project, um, what we trying to offer the, the kind of conceptual level uh, is to offer, <coughs> kind of develop the, um, 
kind of mobility as a service X road. But the concept is a little bit similar to the Estonian uh, X road idea, which is a data exchange layer between different databases. So we try to implement something similar in transportation section. Uh, so it means that there is a kind of open source um, uh, data exchange layer, which is reliable and open for different kinds of um, service providers uh, in order to connect their services. Uh, and also we want to collect uh, data because if we bring uh, new uh, types of vehicles on the streets like self-driving vehicles, they are loaded with different sensors, uh, which is in the first case, of course, needed for the um, navigation and then and performing their own um, mission. Uh, but still the same data can be used uh, for the other purposes as well. So we were looking for the ways that uh, how we can open this data, what vehicles are collecting uh, and enables them to, to make a new services based on that data. But of course, the, the main um, target or goal is still to, to offer a user-friendly and convenient service for the passengers. So, so the idea is to connect the self-driving vehicles, uh, on-demand-based self-driving uh, vehicles, uh, shuttles or, or uh, fixed road uh, shuttles uh, with the current public transport. And the, if we can manage also include the micromobility into this um, transportation system. Uh, the pilot, which should uh, really um, take place uh, on the field or on in the uh, specific area and close to the Tallinn, is, is uh, also defined and, and we are working quite quite hard to make it happen. Uh, so it's it's quite, uh, let's say, uh, difficult in the sense of many details need to be solved. But the idea is that uh, the, the first we have a suburban area close to Tallinn, uh, which is Rae, Paris. And there we have identified one specific uh, area where we want to deploy uh, last mile uh, shuttle, uh, two or three of them, which are um, uh, offering on-demand based service. This means that a uh, person can order uh, the sheltering shuttle on its front door, and then it brings to the a main public transport bus stop. Um, so in that way, uh, the person can continue um, you know, the journey to the Tallinn, um, I think which is um, five, six, or, or maybe 10 kilometer right, uh, there we have a hub in the Ulemiste, which is a huge uh, rail Baltic terminal, but also airport and, uh, and um, <clears throat> technical uh, area. Um, and you can, uh, let's say, change your way to the micromobility means. So we focus micromobility on the, on the Ulemiste. And then in, in the Tallinn uh, city, you can take a tram and continue to the harbor. Um, where we also want to deploy one uh, self-driving shuttle, which um, connects the drum stop with uh, Terminal A. And in that way, we also continue to Helsinki. Uh, so there are different types of transport, uh, for public transport involved, but also uh, the main focus is still on the self-driving vehicles. As that's our main expertise. And our partners are the city of Tallinn, Raya Paris, and of course, the Alto. Uh, and, and right now we are working quite quite hard uh, with the mobility as a service uh, data exchange platform and also very happy that in the seminar uh, I saw that Nordic Institute is uh, participating uh, as we really would like to um, uh, use the X-Road infrastructure um, um, which supports the, this uh, mobility as a service data exchange layer. Uh, and uh, of course our main uh, uh, area like said already uh, a shuttle or robot bus uh, and we just released a new uh, version design and right now um, focusing to the manufacturing process to really make a new vehicle which we call the version two of this auto um, that we can use to the next year uh, pilot um, it's it's full of uh, small issues we need to solve uh, specifically for the manufacturing uh, process, as we as a university are not uh, car manufacturers, we need to uh, procure the body panels and, and, and all uh, different mechanical parts also. 
the process it's not easy but i still hope that uh, we can manage and have a new passes uh next year uh we can deploy on, on this pilot so far we have our own uh shuttle um this is out version one but uh it's it's not a street legal in in mechanical sense so, so we really need to have a new vehicles uh, we are working with the simulations and then validations to, in order to improve the safety uh Mopsen is uh, going in more detail on that topic so i don't really cover it uh, and also the data collection that when I, what i mentioned before is that uh, it's very common to collect data from the classical centers like temperature or road conditions and so on we want to focus more to uh, let's say more fuzzy data which we can collect from uh, lidars uh, cameras uh, radars and and based on that massive data make some kind of um, decisions uh, for example we can measure the speed of scooters and then uh, you see that these are over speeding or reckless scootering so we offered some kind of scenarios what can be used but main idea is still to offer the open data so that everyone basically can uh, build their own service or, or mobile app or whatever uh, based on that open data what uh, every shuttles are collecting and the drive around in, in specific area for example one pretty interesting uh, uh, small uh, experiment we did is that to identify a kind of violent behavior uh, by ai so it's it's pretty uh, interesting stuff you can do very easily actually but of course there are different data um, uh, collection issues we need to solve and as a sum summarizing uh, this intro that um, in order to bring this uh, auto autonomous vehicles on the streets, the main concern is, of course, the safety. It's not only in the AV shuttle, uh, but in general, um, the self-driving vehicles. So the biggest concern is, is always safety, and that's also very understandable. And of course, it also includes the cybersecurity, because you probably can imagine that uh, what can happen if, if these uh, vehicles are teleoperated, which the most cases uh, are in the future so if someone's take it over and uh, drives into the crowd so it's uh, it's not what we really want to see so it's cyber security issues are definitely rising and we have to pay a lot of attention to it so there is another uh, presentation about um, cyber security issues today later uh, and we cannot avoid connectivity again it's connected to the um, cyber security but there's also this uh, open data, what we really can get with the vehicles uh, should be made public available. Uh, and that's that we also want to show as a, as a case study uh, how to do this. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope it got a kind of context, uh, what you're doing also a little bit for the next presentations. And um, I believe that the questions are uh, coming on the panel, so I, I leave my floor here. Yeah, thank you, Raibo. Uh, and, and, and then, then uh, oh, we are on schedule. Great. Uh, uh, Andrew James Roberts uh, from, from Taltec uh, will, will give a short uh, presentation of citation of Okay, I think I just lost you there, but I can start. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Andrew Roberts. Uh, today I'll be providing you a presentation about cybersecurity in urban traffic. Um, so perhaps I can just give you a bit of an introduction about myself. Um, so originally I'm from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in information technology. Um, after graduating, I spent a number of years at a telecommunications company, a Japanese one called Nippon Telephone Telegraph, NTT. I uh, worked as a kind of network engineer and data storage engineer. I then worked in Australian government, um, got a master's in cybersecurity from the University of New South Wales. And then I came to Estonia and I also have a master of cybersecurity um, from Tallinn University of Technology. 
And now I'm an early stage researcher at the Finesse Center for Smart Cities, where I predominantly focus on um, autonomous vehicle cybersecurity, uh, specializing in um, the security analysis of autonomous vehicle networks. So when we think of the urban traffic environment of the future, and this kind of ties into um, Sorry, I just lost it. Yep, uh, to what uh, Rivo was talking about before, this urban traffic environment of the future is one which has dense interconnectivities. So as we can see in this kind of um, graphic uh, that is dreamed of by Bosch and Daimler, um, we're talking about a multimodal transportation environment where you have um, consumptive services like AV vehicle shuttles, um, private services like your car, um, last mile services like uh, scooters and bikes. And uh, these are predominantly kind of uh, autonomous based services as autonomous um, vehicles and the whole benefit of autonomous vehicles, they offer um, better safety as well as uh, better coordination of the traffic environment. We see a consumptive based environment. So it's where the consumer is getting a experience in the smart city tailored to what their needs and expectations are. Um, and, and this is driven by the consumers. Sorry. Uh, it seems multiple people are not seeing your slides anymore. Oh, okay. Sorry, that's a bit odd. Thanks. See you again. Good. Okay. Um, so yeah, this this draws on the you know concept of um, the the digital citizen um, directing uh, the services they need in, in the in the city environment. So cybersecurity challenges. So we we've kind of moved from a kind of legacy environment where we've had. Uh, we haven't had internet connected systems. Um, they've just been legacy protocols that have never been desi um, designed for the challenge of kind of cyber threats or were never designed ever to be internet connected. Um, so a really kind of good highlight of this was in 2015 when uh, some two security researchers, uh, they tried some experiments with a um, connected vehicle, which was a Jeep. Um, so what they did is they, they got the infotainment system. So this infotainment system is the one that probably features in the cars that you drive. Um, you connect to it by Bluetooth and by wireless connections. So these researchers installed malware on the infotainment head, head unit. Um, this malware enabled them to remotely access uh, the infotainment system. So as this Jeep Cherokee drove, they were able to connect to the wireless interfaces in the infotainment system uh, whilst being in another car. And they were able to lat laterally move through the networks of the um, Jeep Cherokee. And they were able to get to what's called the controller area network, um, which is kind of the internal network of the vehicle, um, which records the vehicle's uh, movement behavior. And they were able to remotely put uh, slam the brakes on the Jeep Cherokee. So they were able to show that a connected vehicle could be attacked by a cyber attacker and that, it, that a cyber attacker could alter the behavior of the vehicle. If we transition to a couple of years forward and kind of the first versions of uh, the Tesla models, um, when they were starting uh, autopilot, you have a lot of uh, issues with um, the object detection algorithms. So for instance, you had cars that were carrying trailers, which had a different color, uh, which might be colored white. <clears throat> and the autopilot was detecting that as a, um, as, as, as a road marker and was you know, not stopping or accelerating into that object and causing crashes as we can see on the right. Um, this is mainly, I'm, I'm going to hesitate and say it's mainly, I mean, this wouldn't happen today, um, because as we've seen with these uh, collisions, we've got better at training, um, you know, neural networks and, and machine learning models um, to deal with these kind of edge and, and test in corner cases. And um, Moses will talk about simulation testing later. Um, but this has a really important feature for cybersecurity. Uh, 
So early when we had these machine learning attacks, you could change the um, pixel profile of an object by putting some kind of uh, rogue sticker, sticker uh, computer generated stickers or some kind of uh, um, rogue uh, display markings, which would change the behavior of the vehicle um, based on the ML algorithm. So the challenges for the platforms of autonomous vehicles and autonomous systems in the smart city are the fact that this dense inter interconnectivity means there's um, inherently a lot of uh, wireless interfaces. There's still, and there will be for a long time, legacy communication protocols. So as I said, the controller area network uh, in vehicles is something that will um, you know, continue to be a present, even though there are new versions, um, CAN bus will still always be there. Um, there's a very, very complex software ecosystem. So the modern vehicle, I think, is speculated to have around 120 million lines of code. Um, so how do we ensure that that code uh, doesn't allow threat vectors like um, buffer overflows or expl exploitation of race conditions is really difficult. And then we have uh, the robustness of the ML and AI algorithms. And these are kind of very much ongoing challenges with the kind of dynamism of um, development in this area. In the urban traffic environment specifically, uh, so we have introduction of kind of um, a lot of different uh, platforms in this environment. So if we take just one use case example, which is of a delivery drone, um, the airways of a city is, is normally tightly controlled for obvious reasons because you do, don't want congestion um, because you have passenger uh, airplanes also operating in this environment and you also have buildings and other hazards. Uh, so how to incorporate uh, a technology such as drones into the city environment um, is, is a difficult challenge and, and also to, to do it so it is... Um, these drones could not be hacked and, and used as a kind of a weapon or a, a means to extract um, sensitive data from. Uh, so there's kind of um, initiatives such as the uh, idea of setting up a public key infrastructure uh, to be able to uh, appropriately certify new devices that want to interact in the smart city um, to ensure that they are authentic devices and they are operated legitimately by a legitimate operator. And the ability of um, transport management or city management to be able to um, revoke uh, rogue devices that come into the environment or devices which are no longer trusted, um, either they've been manipulated by cyber threat um, or they've been taken over by other means. Another inherent part of this smart city environment will be the um, city infrastructure to support it and this dense inter interconnection. So you're going to see a lot of um, vehicle, vehicle to everything, um, V to X kind of uh, intelligent uh, roadside side unit um, infrastructure. Um, these are really important for autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you want a net, network-based communication um, to, to manage uh, the transport environment. So as I understand at the moment, with the traffic lights, you pre-program your traffic lights and you just stick them in the ground and that's how it is. Um, the benefits of these uh, intelligent roadside units is they offer the ability to be programmed on the fly and um, have a more dynamic uh, way of managing the transport. The problem is with this kind of communication oriented platform, um, these communication messages can often be spoofed, uh, they can often be intercepted. So the challenges for cybersecurity is that we ensure the integrity of network communication uh, from the infrastructure to the platforms around it. Cybersecurity testing is a really important uh, topic, um, especially for vehicles. There's a new UN regulation, 155, and I think it's 154. 155 uh, UN regulation says from 2022, all semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicles that are 
will be produced need to have a cyber security testing um, certification uh, to be enabled to be operating in, in the traffic environment. Um, so, and the standard which base, uh, backs that is ISO 21434, which is cybersecurity engineering for road vehicles. So what we see concurrent research and research and industry um, is a focus on how to achieve this, first of all. Uh, so for instance, I can't just get a vehicle, drive it on the road and do a, you know, a cyber, cyber attack on it um, because of the obvious risks to both the passengers and the people in the environment, but also the high cost of doing that if I destroy the car. So there's a real focus on kind of innovative testing environments. So there's a focus on, for instance, digital twins. So how do we kind of digitally replicate the systems and subsystems of a autonomous transportation platform that would enable us to do some level of cybersecurity testing and determine whether our, our vehicle is um, secure against cyber, cybersecurity threats? Um, so a lot of this is done at taking, for instance, uh, a vehicle electronic control unit. Um, they'll take the firmware, they'll, they'll take the operating systems, the firmware, the cryptographic libraries, and they'll compare, uh, the, they'll take those digital replicas and they'll look at the existing kind of common vulnerability um, exploitations and see if, uh, any anything in the kind of software stack is um, is vulnerable to uh, you know uh, pro pro prominent cybersecurity threats. There is a calculation on the level of coverage that you can do on cybersecurity. Um, so don't expect that your product will be secure against one hundred percent of all the cyber threats in the environment there has to be a risk calculation on what threats are most applicable. For the hardware, you'll also have hardware in the loop simulators uh, where engineers will test um, whether products are, are safe on, on hardware-based attacks and whether those wireless interfaces that I talked about are accessible remotely from an, an, an attacker. There are also real world proving ground environments, um, which offer a, a closed and control um, space in which to conduct uh, cybersecurity testing, although they are still very limited at this stage. One of the, uh, I guess, most promising, and I talked about this kind of, uh, you know, ML, AI kind of adversarial um, cyber threats. So it's really important to be testing in simulators and to be developing methods for cybersecurity testing using simulators. <clears throat> and we've seen, <clears throat> we've seen some really nice examples of security testing using, for instance, uh, the Baidu Apollo simulator. So they're, they're doing kind of a level of fuzz testing. Um, so fuzz testing some of the software applications, but also some of the sensors uh, so, for instance, if I send random data input uh, to a LiDAR sensor, um, will my vehicle crash uh, into the trees or crash into another vehicle? Or will it continue to be on its way or will it stop? How does a, um, a malicious a data input um, affect the kind of decision making or control of the vehicle? So in a simulator, we can do these things. In the real life, we can't because we just don't have a million vehicles to be able to crash. Um, so the simulator provides a really important um, testing environment for cybersecurity. And that's something that we're exploring in the uh, Tautec Autonomous Research Group. So future research topics um, that I think it's important for the community and, and understand. So as I said, understanding the security of these sensors and cyber physical systems. Um, the privacy and data protection, as Rivo kind of pointed out, is incredibly important. Um, so for instance, if you're in the if you're an autonomous vehicle, um, you have cameras, uh, blurring images of the people in the environment, or um, ensuring that you have uh, GDPR 
uh, that your GDPR compliant is, is really incredibly important. Um, this also counts for privacy in your um, training sets in, in uh, for your you know, machine learning algorithms and in, ensuring that uh, people, that the citizens that we need to trust the systems have the, uh, are comfortable with the data that's being generated and are comfortable that their privacy is inherent to this process. Uh, ensuring hardware security and hardware security modules will be incredibly important um, because as there is uh, these legacy uh, protocols and systems, um, embedding hardware security modules gives us the ability to encrypt um, very vulnerable kind of normally plain text uh, legacy communication protocols. And also to ensure uh, processes like um, you know bootloaders or secure boot, um, uh, you know when you start up your car, it's, it starts with the genuine integrity, and no one's inserted lines of code to um, change the processes. Security of vehicle communications is uh, and autonomous communications is extremely important. As I said, in this dense interconnected environment. Uh, the integrity of the communication um, that your vehicle can communicate to a, a roadside unit or could communicate to other vehicles and other platforms, ensuring that the um, situational awareness uh, that's being communicated is accurate to the traffic environment is of predominant importance. And this is an application rich uh, environment. So ensuring that um, the application uh, platforms of the vehicle. Uh, so for instance, autonomous vehicles, it's robotic operating system, or, you know, there's, there's others as well, um, ensuring the security of that system um, to prevent any kind of application inject attacks. And then intrusion anomaly detection systems will become standard in um, autonomous system platforms. So <clears throat> your cars of the future will need to have a level of network monitoring to ensure the integrity of those systems. <clears throat> um, forensics is, is an important topic, but not one which I'm an expert, but at the moment your vehicles do have an event data recorder. So for instance, if you crash your car, um, the data of the last 20 seconds of the vehicle's movements is recorded and it can be extracted from the police. Um, think of now you've got an autonomous vehicle, there's a lot more data sources, so that makes it even harder to um, accurately cord the last moments of the vehicle. Uh, so that's why we need, and although a lot of vehicles do have um, logging systems, it's ensuring that it's a level of detail that's required to do um, post-crash uh, reconstruction and a level of um, body physics uh, required from forensic investigators. So that will be a um, more important topic as we go forward with autonomous vehicles in the traffic environment. Um, the autonomous systems and smart city is very much a cloud-based infrastructure. So ensuring that um, edge computing, um, where some of the algorithms uh, may be doing some processing. So making sure that uh, the, the edge and, and cloud environment is, is protected. Um, and as I'm running out of time, I'd say uh, the ensuring that we have security uh, in the design of emerging technologies um, and that security is an inherent part of development is an incredibly important uh, future research topic. So thank you. And I'll hand over to Mosin. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, sounds very dangerous business, this, this autonomous <laughs> mobility <laughs> to me. You were mentioned, mentioned about, about, about simulation uh, several times, and, and, and now Mohsen will continue uh, about simulation and verification. So, so we'll let the discussion, as, as said a couple of times, to, to, to the end. Uh, okay. So, so um, something like eleven o'clock starts the lively discussion. So, please be active okay. at that Hello, time. Everyone. So, Mohsen, I'm, please. Yes, uh, I'm Mohsen uh, Malajordi from uh, Autonomous System Lab at Caltech University. I'm presenting the simulation and verification framework that we are uh, using for verifying or assessing our algorithm that's currently running on the on our ISO 
mini shuttle. Uh, so let's try to just uh, look at our, you know, schematic, uh, just a brief look at our schematic to see what we are doing uh, currently here. Uh, first, uh, we need some requirements to just run this setup. One of our, uh, you know, there are t uh, three main requirements here. Uh, one of the main one is virtual environment creation. We need the virtual environment to run our setup on it. And uh, the other one is the digital twin of the uh, current vehicle that is the ESA Auto, AV 3D model. And the other one is the plan for running the vehicle on that plan. It's our scenario that we want to test our vehicle based on that scenario. After that, we need a, plat we need a platform to just uh, simulate everything. That is our simulator. We are currently using the SVL simulator is from the LG uh, Corporation. Uh, based on uh, the other step, it's so important for us to just uh, involve the current software, the current control cipher in the loop. It's somehow, it's a software in the loop simulation. So basically what we are trying to do is using, uh, you know, uh, a combination of the current software and a simulator and connecting these two based on a ROS bridge to communicate and control the vehicle in the simulated environment to check different algorithms like perception algorithm, planning algorithm, and control one. And after that, we just run our scenario. It, it, maybe we plan for running thousand scenario. And after that, we gather and record all the data to analyze the result uh, at the you know finishing or at the end of the uh, simulation. And based on that result, we can just uh, gather different uh, suggestion or we can analyze uh, different part of our control software to ensure about the safety or ensure about the behavior of the vehicle in different situations. So let's take a look at what we are doing for creating our virtual environment. We have a graph here that shows different main step of the uh, creation. So first of all, we need a way to capture data of that environment. We choose the drone camera to capture images of the environment. Then by that images, we create a point cloud. So by using different software, we create a you know, uh, point cloud of uh, the object that existed on that area, a specific area. Uh, for the first uh, sample, we used our campus area that is mainly uh, designed for running the Isoto on that area. So we want to capture or create a virtual twin of that specific area inside our simulator. After creating the point cloud, uh, we classify different objects. For example, like buildings, uh, different objects like uh, light poles or, uh, I mean, uh, vegetations or different area of that uh, environment. We uh, make it separately, then we can just assign different feature or design, assign different settings to each object uh, to control uh, different feature on the uh, final step that is creating the train out of the point cloud. After all of this, we have a unity train that is useful for our uh, simulator that is SVL because our SVL is working based on a game engine that is unity. So basically we need to create our virtual environment on the unity uh, platform. So uh, here you can see a point cloud that is separated from the ground. It's mainly, uh, we mainly did it because uh, we need to classify objects easily. Uh, by removing the ground, now we can just separate buildings, for example, from uh, different vegetation and also uh, light poles uh, and uh, different, maybe we can just filter different objects like car, car parked in the area or any other unwanted uh, object in the area. This is the segmentation part. And for example, here, as uh, you can see, here is a filtering of the you know, parking area. For example, we don't need some uh, unwanted leveling uh, of the ground so we can remove it easily. 
or after uh, at the final stage uh, after classification you can see we merge everything together but you can see different uh, classified objects is, is exist on the map building vegetation and also ground attached to the merge point cloud and after that we can easily create uh, our uh, train on the unity side as you can see it's a digital train of the current area inside the, uh, our campus that we are running our vehicle inside the road so after we create our uh, virtual environments it's time to put our vehicle puts the digital twin of our vehicle inside the environment so we already create the same digital twin inside the, uh, the unity platform and everything from the body and also from the sensor configuration is matched to the real vehicle and as you can see we put it inside in the in the right picture we put it inside the environment and the red uh, you know lines is indicating the sensor detection of that area uh, the next step and the important step of the simulation verification is uh, creating a plan for verification we call it scenarios. We mainly uh, create thousand scenario based on different methods. One of the you know uh, well known method is fuzzing, just you know creating random uh, happening scenario of a selected area. For example, as you can see here, we are trying to overtake a vehicle here, and at the same time, a blue car is reaching to uh, our vehicle in the opposite lane. So. We want to check our vehicle behavior in this kind of situation. So based of, based of this decision, we should create a bunch of scenario to just uh, varying the speed of different actors in that is uh, you know playing in the scenario. The front car, the back car, and also our isolated car. After uh, we Finishing uh, all the scenario, I mean, finishing the simulation of all scenario, it's now time to analyze the result. It's a little bit tricky because imagine you get maybe thousands or million results. What you want to do with that kind of result? Maybe the best way is just separating, uh, you know, or uh, clustering the result. As you can see in the image, we're clustering the result by the means of, for example, the travel distance that the vehicle uh, did in the, inside the simulation and also distance to collision. So by means of that, we can see what kind of, you know, how many of that scenario is, was successful, how many of them was unsuccessful. And we can also record, is there any collision happened during the scenario or others, uh, for example, factor happens during the running. So by just clustering, we can may, maybe easily um, interpret uh, the results here. And also we can just uh, plot, for example, a, a spaghetti uh, graph out of the you know, traveling uh, route of the car to check how many of them are you know, unsuccessful or how many of them can reach to the final uh, destination or final goal that we define for the vehicle. And at the end point or uh, the purpose of this uh, study is to just offering some suggestion to the, to the, for example, our colleague that mainly work on the uh, developing of the software, control software. So for example, as you can see here, we have a trajectory that uh, our vehicle is following that kind of trajectory to overtake an obstacle here. This, uh, the first one is not an optimized one. So we just run a bunch of scenario, a bunch of simulation and varying different uh, or changing the parameter of the overtaking. Uh, I mean, the, for example, the control algorithm parameters or maybe uh, the detection, for example, defining how many uh, or uh, defining what distances should vehicle decided to overtake. 
So by defining this parameter, uh, we can uh, optimize our trajectory or our path that planned for, for example, mission like overtaking. As you can see in the next uh, image, it's actually follow accurately. I mean, follow the waypoint accurately. So it means that our vehicle is follow the exact uh, way that the exact route that we define for it. So it doesn't go off the road uh, or just behave uh, unpredictably uh, through the mission. And uh, yeah, this is the way that we suggest, for example, optimize parameter or any other suggestion for localization specifically or for prediction for uh, perception. I mean, the detection algorithm should be optimized for detecting uh, all object inside the simulation. We can just uh, suggest a bunch of uh, offer for optimizing or for developing our algorithm. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mohsen. All right, you were short. <laughs> Refreshing to have some, some details also. It's, it's, we, we are trying to popularize here also, but it's good, good, to, good to see and hear maybe, details also. Yeah. yeah, maybe I could start by asking a, again a detailed question related to the scanning and creating of the virtual environment. So uh, do you separate between uh, stationary and, and mobile objects uh, when you do uh, do this uh, above ground objects? So do you, for example, separate between uh, between buildings and cars that uh, are parked yeah. because parked cars can yes. move? Yes, that's a good question. During our image capturing, uh, uh, I mean, our main software, Agisoft, is detecting moving object and remove it smoothly from the images. And there is no effect of moving object in our final point cloud because our main uh, purpose is just capturing the static object inside our environment. Okay, but for example, if you have a parked car, they are stationary during the imaging. But uh, again, you could identify quite easily or separate, uh, let's say, a car from a building or, or from a tree. But uh, is, is that something that is uh, valuable for, for the simulation or is something that is completely neglected at this point? Uh, yes, uh, actually, it's a, another good point uh, for mentioning. Uh, for example, if there is anything inside our road, I mean, the operation, op operational road for our vehicle, we can remove it easily during, for example, after creating the point cloud, we can removing based on different feature of that object height or any other thing that uh, it's, for example, it's in the middle of the road, we want to remove that object or get rid of this kind of, you know, unwanted object. It's easily can be done by filtering uh, the, you know, point cloud. Uh, after, for example, after segmentation, it's now, it's so obvious that we can just select it or select a specific, you know, part of the point cloud and remove it. Yeah, it can be done. Perfect, thanks. Uh, yeah, well, it comes to my mind, the another, another large gear pilot, Green Twins, uh, that is con concentrating on, on uh, or creating digital twins of plantations and, and individual plants. How, how they are in winter time, how they are summer time, how they grow, how they, how they you know the constant change. They are perhaps too too detailed for you at the moment, but but might be good to have collaboration in in, in the future with, with these two two very sort of big uh, large scale pilots in the in the future. Um, well, uh, I think we we could we could go to oh there are one. Before we let Kurki will we'll comment, uh, schedules 11 o'clock, so we have five minutes time for extra discussions at, at the moment. So there were. There's a uh, question. Yeah. How do you pronounce the name? Mer Merjimi Ibrahimi. Please. Yes. It's Go ahead. Right. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, I am a PhD student in Taltec. And I'm very interested in uh, to see and like focusing on how data are used in self-driving cars. And specifically, I want to address the question um, uh, in terms of detecting the environment around. Like, how do you train the algorithm of the self-driving car on really recognizing that 
uh, this is a person and the self-driving car has to stop. And um, how does the algorithm really recognize like the, the, there is like this the diversity of data in terms of the, there is a, for example, a person, a young person or an old person, and then the self-driving car has to stop in terms so that the, uh, the, the people can pass the street. Um, I hope my question was clear. Maybe like how does the diversity really treat it in these algorithms uh, when training uh, in the self-driving cars? I, I can just generally comment, but we have um, much more specialists here. But in general, yes, it's, it's not the self-driving vehicle specific training, but it's just a kind of common AI and machine learning training algorithms what we need to apply. And uh, in many cases, it's actually manual work that you, you collect the data and then you kind of do the supervised uh, uh, training so that uh, you, you train your algorithm to, to match the specific area. So mm -hmm. that's actually very much true that and that's also the why we need to create the simulations and map uh, that's uh, that the part of the work is actually once we have captured the area where we want to deploy our vehicles, uh, we create a digital twin like Mosin explained but also we need to train the algorithms uh, uh, to match this environment. Uh, <clears throat> and and it's, uh, it can be like uh, different in, in geographical means. There are very different objects, like we very often make example, like if we drive in a Florida, then we can have a like a crocodile lying on the exactly. road, which never happens here in, in Estonia. Uh, and there's no sense to try to detect the crocodiles on the road. So it's probably something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, of course, the, the seasonal uh, differences. So we had a, like experience uh, where the map is created, vehicle is driving, um, and when the autumn, when the leaves are falling away, then the map is so different that uh, the vehicle gets lost because of that. So you need to make a new map. And of course, in winter time, when we have also tested with the snow piles, uh, uh, it's totally different uh, again. So you just need to train it uh, and, and maybe you need to switch the, uh, <clears throat> the data set which you're relying on, uh, just depending where you're driving, when you're driving. And uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. so it's called like um, ODT, what you need to define. And, and that's uh, directly connected also for the certification that, get, that uh, when you <clears throat> get the certification for a vehicle, then you, uh, as a L4 vehicle, you define the ODD, which exactly specifies the, the conditions where it, uh, when and, and how or when, where it's uh, able to drive autonomously and where it's not uh, able to drive autonomously. Mm -hmm. And all these aspects must take into account. But may, I mean, if you want to get the more technical details, uh, I see S and our uh, main uh, AI developer of the vehicle software is here again comment and also I see Mauro who is dealing with the um, sensor fusion and, uh, and all these aspects are here. So if, if you're interested more in, in very deep technical level, I'm sure they, they can <laughs> jump in. Thank you, Raivo, and uh, thanks for the question. Maybe we can take the discussion for the later part. Yes, so, so get a couple of uh, comments first from the from the panelists and and I, I I agree this is this might be a very interesting topic to discuss so how to simulate these uh, dynamic objects uh, people animals and and like you mentioned for example snow piles uh, maybe we can get into that uh, later on but right now let's get a comment from uh, Ville Kyrki from Alta University. So good morning, everyone. Uh, can you confirm that you hear my voice? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes. Perfect, perfect. So first, thanks for invitation. Uh, it's really nice to be part of this seminar. It's an interesting topic, and uh, I'm uh, honored to be uh, one of the commenters. I'm associate professor at Aalto University, and uh, uh, one of the principal in investigators at the Aalto Center for Autonomous Systems, and participates in the Aalto autonomous car project. So um, that means that this area or, or the entire project that we are discussing today is very much 
central to my own research activities and also uh, of great interest to me uh, in person. So uh, based on the three presentations we heard, I kind of want to raise maybe two challenges and potential conflicts that, that have been appearing, I guess, across all the presentations. And first of them is the, uh, the conflict between safety and performance. So that we want to get autonomous vehicles in terms of um, um, building systems that could uh, uh, increase the efficiency and, and performance of our transport systems. And we want to do that by building machines that can help, uh, help people. But like we've seen, the certification of the safety of these systems is difficult. And usually there is an inherent conflict between safety and, and performance. For example, if we have an autonomous car that never moves, it's certifiable safe, but it's not very useful. And on the other hand, the, uh, the faster the cars move, usually the, uh, the different challenges in safety, for example, the uh, fatality rate of, of pedestrian car accidents increases very clearly with respect to the collision speed. So in the cases of low speed cars, like what we have here, uh, primarily in, uh, in the, this project, the, the uh, probability of fatality, even when a collision happens is very low. So, so basically we do get accidents, but the accidents are not fatal, which affects of course the safety analysis and the safety, uh, different kinds of safety scenarios that have be, to be taken into account. So, so there is some kind of, safety versus performance trade-off. And uh, one, one of the things that was raised here also is uh, as one of the particular safety challenges beyond, beyond cybersecurity is the use of, and or reliance to, or to machine learning and AI, different uh, AI solutions. And uh, there I want to raise maybe one point that has not been raised before, which is that uh, that depending on the particular machine learning solutions, but many of our current uh, machine learning solutions are doing best effort. So what, what that means is that they are at the moment trying to provide a best explanation for whatever they see. And then whether it's right or wrong, they will provide one explanation, which is somewhat a challenge uh, for, for safety analysis. Uh, uh, because they often are very confident about their predictions. It's not that uh, it's, it's bad to be confident if you are correct, but it's not good to be confident if you are incorrect. So, so what we are moving towards now in machine learning and AI is methods uh, that are, have quantifiable uncertainty or, conf or quantifiable confidence. And that's, that's one thing I see that it's much better to be uncertain if there's something you are not sure about, label that as something you want to maybe be cautious of rather than be confident about that, oh, it's just a bush, even though it might be something else. So that is one thing where we are still kind of moving towards the, uh, how to include these kind of systems in autonomous vehicles. Um, another trade-off or, uh, or conflict we have is the trade-off between privacy and open data that, that was also raised here uh, multiple times. And uh, there, I mean, it's clear like uh, Ravioselle uh, said that in some, kind, some level of open data is key to enable uh, multimodal uh, mobility as a service. Uh, so, on the other hand, that raises serious privacy concerns. The same thing go for any other data that's collected and openly distributed. Uh, open data is important, for example, for training machine learning systems. And data is essential anyway in all kind of training or, and, and learning, uh, which is at the bottom of most current AI methods. So, there is a big uh, conflict between the privacy and open data. Uh, there are not great solutions yet. Um, and I think this is something where, because the privacy is also a, um, 
it's a social issue that is also uh, depends on rules and regulations. Uh, there, uh, we are still looking for the solutions, and the, especially since the legal status and legal regulations evolve, there is we don't know yet what is exactly going to be. Let's say, I mean, we currently know already what the GDPR states, but there are further cases, uh, for example, related to uh, to AI regulations. Uh, what kind of data can be used to train the AIs? Currently uh, in process in the European Union, and we are still waiting for to see what what happens there. Um, one thing that may be a partial uh, or to some extent at least for uh, for safety analysis as well as as privacy issues could be a potential solution uh, is the use of simulators uh, and different kind of virtual models that was also raised here. So that instead of potentially being able to uh, reproduce the data as it was and open the data or the original data, we may have in the future realistic enough simulations that are actually grounded and matched with real data, such that we can say that the simulation uh, uh, or the set of simulation cases covers with sufficient detail the real world situations. And in that case, that simulation data is free of privacy concerns because we don't have any real persons moving there. They are really generated situations. And that's, this is something that I'm uh, quite interested about in order of, let's say, doing either uh, just safety analysis or security analysis um, of systems, but also to uh, look at, let's say, future predictions. So when we do have sufficiently good simulations, we can also st uh, start to explore options such as different kinds of what if scenarios. And this kind of being able to analyze what ifs, such as how would uh, uh, um, the traffic environment change if half of our cars were autonomous? Uh, how, would the, how would that affect, uh, uh, what, what's our prediction? How would that affect the travel times? We don't have any idea of that yet. There are different predictions based on very, very high level models, but we are not yet in the level where we could really do, for example, simulation based analysis. And this is something that is interesting future development. I see quite a lot of potential in. So uh, as a kind of final point, I want to make, make sense that even if we are able to analyze things such as safety in simulation, one, one of the challenges is still in order to, let's say, go beyond uh, engineering safety to safety that is legally safe. And again, the kind of seeing the difference between what it means to be safe in terms of, let's say, no collisions uh, versus what is safe in, uh, in terms of traffic law. Because those are two different things. For example, the traffic law says that we have to have when a car is overtaking pedestrian, uh, the car has to take care and sufficient distance. But there is no regulation which says how much is sufficient. Then when that pedestrian is somehow vulnerable, it's, uh, for example, elderly person or a kid, the, the driver has to take extra care. But that, again, we don't know how much extra distance we need in order to take extra care. So there, there is a, uh, there's a gap between uh, the regulations and the, uh, um, as they are put uh, versus the engineering specifications that we would need in order to go to legally certifiable um, um, uh, methods. And I think that this is still something that we will need uh, or, or there is a need for uh, more, uh, let's say, more specific regulations in these issues the, uh, in order to certify the things and in order to move to mass uh, uh, use of autonomous vehicles. Okay, maybe this is where I want to end my comments in and uh, then let the next commenter start. Thank you, Ville. Uh, quite interesting point you made there. Uh, 
So take a look at this. Um, maybe the last one related to the uh, engineering safety versus uh, social or uh, legislative safety and uh, yeah, I'm also thinking that what, what, what happens between engineering and legislation, there, there, there's a huge, you know, societal acceptance and, yeah. and, and, and sort of social trust and, and, and all that, which is very slow process, uh, taking generations easily. So, yeah, but that, that, that needs social scientists. <laughs> yeah, and of course, <laughs> creating these simulations where, where the uh, characters are, are uh, behaving similar behavior as, as in real life. So for example, what was mentioned previously in the question, uh, older people behave in a different way compared to, for example, little children. Uh, they are unpredictable in different ways. And also their feeling of safety comes from very different sources or in a different way. So, so older people might require a lot more space uh, to an approaching vehicle to feel safe uh, compared to uh, 20 year olds and, and uh, these would be really interesting again to, to take to a next level in, in these simulations and, and again uh, yeah. well, I, 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 I think we opportunities for yeah. future research. I think we shouldn't disturb the specialists discussion <laughs> here so <laughs> maybe we can hear we more to, we from people who actually know this. Our, our, our role but uh, well uh, the, 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 we have prepared for the, the one more uh, sort of prepared uh, uh, well, comment uh, and 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 Peter Kivimäki, who's I, I think he's he's a Finnish person, but but working in in uh, uh, in NIS in Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions or NIS, uh, taking care of I think the X Road data currently uh, non nonprofit uh, company I, I I think, but anyway this this X Road was was mentioned uh, several times. Uh, and, 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 and now from that perspective, uh, we will hear some, some comments. Petteri, yes, so thank you, Ville. Free. And Petteri, yes, your mic yes. is open now. Go ahead. Yes, so uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Petteri Kivimaki. I'm the CTO of Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions, NIS for short. And the NIS is a non-profit association uh, established by the Finnish and Estonian governments in, in 2017. And our mission is to develop digital government solutions to our members. And our first product is, is the X-Road data exchange layer. And uh, yeah, uh, so uh, probably not all of you know what X-Road is and, and what it does. So maybe uh, I just briefly explain uh, what it is and then uh, a couple of comments how it, how it could be used in, in this context. So first of all, uh, originally X-Road was developed in Estonia already uh, 20 years ago. And nowadays uh, it's, it's a worldwide open source solution. It's used uh, around the 20 different countries all around the world. And like I said, it's uh, open source. The source code is available over, uh, under the MIT open source license. So, so you can basically do, do whatever you, you want with it. And uh, uh, the most, uh, most well-known uh, business case for X-Road is uh, national data exchange layer. So uh, XROAD is a data exchange layer that provides secure and unified way to exchange data between organizations. And um, uh, in, in Estonia, it is being used as a national data exchange solution, meaning that all the uh, governmental organizations are, are, are connected to XROAD and, and private, private, uh, many private companies as well, and they exchange data with each other. Uh, from, from technical perspective, XROAD is a secure peer-to-peer -peer network. So uh, XROAD is based on a distributed architecture and every uh, organization and information system that is connected to XROAD, they need to have their own technical access point uh, that is used to communicate with, with other members of the ecosystem. And uh, since XROAD is open source, uh, anyone can get access to the software, install uh, the access point component that is called security server, by the way. 
uh, but uh, before they can start to exchange data with other uh, members, they, they need to register. Uh, the organization needs to be registered and, and also the security server, the access point needs to be registered. And uh, during the registration, uh, both uh, the organization and the access point, they, they need to apply for a certificate uh, that is issued by a trusted certificate authority. And then the certificates and some other metadata are, are registered by the X-Road operator that is responsible for running and operating the ecosystem. So that's kind of the uh, root of trust uh, that uh, that's that's in X Road. So uh, because of the onboarding process and because of the certificates, uh, we know who are the other participants, and we we can we can trust them when when we exchange data with them. And and of course during the data exchange process, uh, the the identity of the other participant is, is verified, and also X Road. X road uh, ensures the, the integrity of the data and also provides an evidence of, of the data exchange so that it uh, an evidence that can be used as a proof uh, even in, in court later on if, if there is a dispute regarding some some transaction if you are uh, familiar with the EIDAS regulation uh, the X road provides EI, EIDAS compliance uh, proofs, uh, e-seals that can be used afterward as an, as an evidence. Uh, and besides Estonia, uh, in, in many, many other countries, XROAD is, is used as a national data exchange layer. That's the case in, in Finland and in, in Iceland as well. Uh, but that's really not the only use case XROAD can, can be used for. Uh, one very interesting uh, interesting case uh, exists in, in Estonia. Uh, the Estonian uh, electricity grid operator is using X-Road uh, to exchange uh, data related to uh, electricity uh, grid operations that unfortunately no, don't know the details, but related to their use case, they, they use X-Road to exchange that data with other uh, European electricity grid operators. So they uh, act as the X-Road operator, the owner of the ecosystem, but at the same time, they are one of the, uh, one of the uh, data exchange uh, members in, in the ecosystem. So there, the idea is uh, that they uh, collect data related to uh, electricity grid operations from uh, different sensors from buildings who, whatever are, are generating the data and and then they use xroad uh, to exchange that data with with other electricity grid operators and i think that's a very interesting and relevant use case uh, regarding autonomous vehicles as well uh, because if we think about uh, Think about how, how the data is, is collected and is exchanged between different components in the, in the architecture and also between different actors in the ecosystem. Uh, there are several different places where X-Road could potentially be used. Uh, some of those places, uh, they, are, they are a good fit for X-Road already today. Uh, while at the same time there are some other places where uh, X Road might require some some further development technically, so that it it could better fit there. Uh, but if if we think about the different uh, different uh, communications that that take place in the ecosystem, so uh, the autonomous vehicle it it is. Uh, collecting a lot of data using its sensors and then uh, that data it is sent to some some backend system or I, I think the term hub was used in the first presentation so uh, the vehicle and the hub need to communicate and then uh, there are different hubs that might communicate with each other and and exchange the data that is uh, collected by the vehicles. Uh, it can be raw data, it can be aggregated data. In, from XROAD perspective, it, it really doesn't matter because XROAD is, is fully data format agnostic. Uh, but in any case, 
uh, today, uh, X-Road uh, is a very good fit for the data exchange between different uh, hubs or different backend systems. So that's already something that X-Road is, is being used in, in all around the world today. Uh, but then if we think about uh, the uh, data exchange between an autonomous vehicle and, and the hub or, or the backend system, a backend system or backend service, then uh, that's that's something a little bit more challenging uh, for X Road, uh, the the autonomous vehicle part, or if we more generally uh, think about it as an edge device. So uh, currently, the X Road security server component it's it's quite heavy to run, and in addition, uh, the registration process. Uh, requires several uh, steps and also some, some manual steps because of the certificates that I, I mentioned in the beginning. So uh, making the security server component more, more lightweight to operate and bringing in more automation to the registration process would enable uh, potentially uh, to run the security server also on, on an edge device which would enable uh, the use of X-Road also in, in the communication between autonomous vehicles and, and the hubs. And that's, that's definitely an, an interesting use case. Uh, but uh, in, in the presentation, it, it wasn't really mentioned uh, how uh, X-Road has been con considered uh, as, as so far in, in in which uh, cases uh, they, they would like to use X-Road. But like I said, there are cases where, where it fits very well also already today, uh, but then uh, for some other cases, some, some further development might be required. But, uh, but either way, uh, NIS as an organization is, is very interested in, in, support, in supporting uh, the use of X-Road in, in this kind of initiatives. And, and we are also very, very, eager to receive feedback and ideas how X-Road would be further developed to, to better serve these kind of use cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought I know something about X-Road, but now I learned that I, I don't know so much. Now. Thank you <laughs> for the extra, extra inf information. Yeah, this is, uh, well, li listening car industry and, 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 and sort of marketing speech saying that the autonomous vehicles come very soon and behind the corner they will pick up us and, and bring us wherever we want and, and it's very cheap and, and comfortable and everything is going fine so it's very very fresh to 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 hear these sort of uncertainties and and and, and things that really needs needs to be uh, improved and, and and done and it takes it takes years or, or, or decades um now yeah. I think, yeah, and particularly in here, if I understand correctly, you are talking about mostly the uh, administrative layer related to operating and handling this data. So, so that's yet another layer uh, that needs to be somehow confronted and and dealt with in order to get to uh, get to an ecosystem uh, that uh, enables, for example, autonomous vehicles to be operating and utilizing all of this data so so controlling of, of, of the data is is regulatory and technically uh definitely going to be a very interesting yeah issue. yeah 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 well well we, we would discuss the whole whole day about the the well, business models and ecosystems uh i'm, I'm well personally interested in how much this future mobility large-scale pilot is, is handling that kind of things that there, there are many companies involved in the project but but probably we are not going to that that direction now. Uh, yeah, so at this point, thank you, Petter, also for your comment. And now I think we can declare the discussion open. Yeah, yeah. Please feel, feel Maybe, free. I, I as, as you know, there's no stupid questions and yeah. so on. Yeah, Raivo, go ahead. I would first a little bit maybe comment uh, the previous comments that uh, um, <laughs> before maybe the general discussion, but, but uh, both uh, uh, comments <clears throat> was actually, I, I'm very much agree. And then uh, also we, we, we'll uh, point out many um, 
uh, many aspects which is definitely very relevant, uh, but there are even many others uh, which come, which we even don't know yet when those self-driving cars really come to our everyday life. And, uh, and uh, here we are definitely as a, as a university, university as a research centers are these who must uh, test them first. Uh, and this conflict between um, different, uh, let's say, parameters like safety versus performance, uh, it's always there. Uh, and not only with these two parameters, but uh, in product development in general, always you are struggling with the conflicts, either like cost uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, like you already uh, realized that the simulations is probably one of the tool we can use more here uh, in order to overcome uh, this conflict. Uh, but also, um, I believe that, that uh, we as a universities can be here a little bit more, let's say, loose. I don't want to say the loose in terms of safety, but, but still we can experiment a little bit more uh, freely with, um, with the different aspects, how, how things work out, of course, in, uh, in safe environment. Uh, uh, but still dry out some, some uh, cutting edge technologies. And, and for example, in this summer, we tried to uh, drive here in campus uh, without safety person on board. And we did it in like two months. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's also a little bit, let's say like risky, but you have to take some risks uh, to try out some, some new features. So if it goes to the um, uh, business side, there are of course there's all the regulations and, and safety aspects and, and uh, legal aspect must be uh, met and then deal uh, even of, or, or much more um, a deeper way and, and um, specifically in mass production. So I believe that we have kind of freedom here to, uh, to do the research and try out different technologies. Uh, and, and give some input to the industry. So what works out and what tools, tools can be used. So, uh, so this is just a comment, but uh, it's not like I'm saying <laughs> those uh, aspects are not relevant or important and totally agree. And what I see that um, maybe would be really, or I think we already kind of started, um, uh, but the collaboration between uh, different research group uh, would really benefit uh, as there is so many aspects you need to deal with uh, uh, in frame of set driving vehicles, you just can't do it uh, all by your own. So uh, really looking forward also the, the deeper collaboration with, uh, with all the research group and autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, one of my doctorand Essan is right now uh, in, in uh, I think in uh, under the Villa's supervision as a uh, quest, uh, uh, research there. So I think in some sense we already started this collaboration, but would be really happy to, uh, to go in even, even uh, next level on it. Um, some comments about this uh, X road also that um, uh, I really went through very quickly on this slide, but uh, the, the idea of how we would like to test uh, this um, or, or let's say apply this extra is a bit different. We really don't want to connect the, the self-driving vehicle with a hub, but rather um, uh, connect the different uh, transportation services uh, through this uh, extra layer or the extra uh, would uh, provide the security infrastructure uh, that the different uh, transportation services can exchange the data. For example, uh, the user interface like mobile app or, or mass app can communicate through the, this data exchange layer with a service provider. Is it like on-demand based uh, self-driving vehicle who offering this service or, or some open trip planner or ticketing service? So, so different um, functions uh, which should give us the good uh, transport service can, uh, can com communicate over this um, data exchange layer, which uh, would partly rely on XROAD. And, and the main idea is that those functional components can be easily replaced or there can be many of them. For example, we can have a different uh, user interfaces. We can have a different um, trip planners, different service providers who provides the transportation service and so on. Because the currently the, the problem is that uh, all uh, wants to solve all these parts by their own. Like uh, you are 
clue to some specific app or or company like Bolt or uh, Traffy or others. So, uh, so you can't really um, make the, the the place open for every participant. But if you keep this layer open and open source, so it's easy to replace different functions or even use them uh, in the same time. So these are short comments. Um, just wanted to add. Thank you, Raiwa. Yeah. So do we have, if, if no further yeah. questions, Kalle, you had a question in your mind uh, related oh. to yeah, yeah. the commercialization. Oh, of yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's well, I, I don't know. Well, well question, is, is it relevant to discuss in, in this session at all uh, about this, this, this whole ecosystem and, 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 and the, well, the, the probably companies creating data in, in the future, all these hubs, uh, linked to 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 X road and 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 what kind of business model they they would have to live and to be motivated to to to, to contribute uh, because in 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 university well, uh, world we we easily think that the data comes and and what can you do with the data and 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 all sort of technical um, suitabilities but 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 as 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 we have seen in 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 the real world the mass mass companies are in big difficulties that, I mean, the private ones well, like Mars Global in, in Finland, uh, well, not bankrupted, but, but, but going down clearly uh, uh, because different stakeholders like has in the region transport or, or national railroads are, are not willing to, to share everything. Uh, and, and, and they have their own sort of, well, legacies and, 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 and simply business models, especially private companies having having simply they, they cannot afford to 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 get everything for free so so uh, how, 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 are you handling these things at all in in this future mobility large scale pilot uh, but that's exactly the the reason why we want to make this um, data exchange that are open so that cities doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to make a long term deal with one company but, uh, but the different players can really connect to the, this state exchange layer. And then of course, there is a, up to the, the peak uh, public transport system companies, do they offer the, some data for, let's say free, or do they connect to this layer or not? But, but this can be also handled by the contracts between the cities and those transport providers. So you usually have some terms that, okay, if we make a long-term contract with you, you have to make some part of data public available like schedules and, and uh, the location of vehicles are already actually public uh, public data everyone can access this and uh, and then if if this kind of open layer is provided by the either the city government or or a national government or, or someone else then it makes much more easier to, uh, to come also the smaller players uh, and offer something some new function is based on this data exchange or or a user application or like this uh, trip planner more like let's say ai based more clever trip planner or 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 whatever <clears throat> service we even don't know at the moment so that's the idea what we want to demonstrate as a concept but we are not going to make it as a as a final product it's not in the scope of this project we just want to demonstrate <clears throat> that how we think it would be let's say the ideal case for the cities but then it's up to the cities or other organization to take it over and then develop in the further as, as a real product or not that that's not the case anymore for the university to go into the like technical production or, or software uh, uh, development yeah Thank all right you. yeah that, yeah yeah that, that that's good uh, sounds reasonable because i will well uh, as as the mass specialists like like sami sahala in in, in forum virum helsinki they're saying saying that the the, the sort of trend uh, should be uh, from private companies to, to public bodies, cities, uh, and, and perhaps national bodies that they should take care of, of the mass sort of uh, concept. And, and of course, smaller companies then, then, then might contribute in, in, in sort of little or, or smaller, smaller details. So, so yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, anything else from the audience? Uh... Or do we have to come up with questions? I have a couple already in my mind, but uh, please uh, 
feel free to contribute to the discussion uh, while waiting for questions from the audience. And then maybe I will uh, bring up a question related to the separation of uh, critical and not so critical data. So maybe Andrew, for example, you could comment on that. So, so how does this happen? How, how do you make sure that, uh, uh, for example, an individual uh, autonomous vehicle or even regular vehicle that has and accesses contingent data uh, can separate the data? Does it have to take place on hardware level or can you build firewalls uh, inside the system? So, that's, so that, for example, the things that you mentioned uh, uh, jamming or or uh, misleading or providing wrong data to to a system doesn't lead to a disaster so how do you control that your uh, bluetooth device that is connected to to a vehicle uh, does not interfere with the navigation system for example and uh, is is this something that is being handled already or or are there some open issues related to to this um so some elements so, some elements are being handled already. So, for instance, in um, your new kind of flash Mercedes or BMW cars to, today, um, the body control module ECU, which um, is the ECU which, you know, affects the uh, odometry of the vehicle, all the critical functions, has an inbuilt uh, firewall, which... Um, whitelists uh, certain services. So um, no network communication is getting into the internal uh, vehicle of the car. Um, so only those critical operations, are, they're totally separate. Um, in the autonomous vehicle kind of model, it's about finding the network instructions about what application, uh, what level two kind of service is important. So for instance, for teleoperation, um, the uh, teleoperation kind of um, connection, and this will mainly be a 4G, 5G connection. This will be given the highest priority by the um, uh, telecommunication operator, whether that be tele, tele or, or whatever. So it has to have the lowest latency. So the um, messages from the teleoperation remote control center. So this is the um, remote control driver to your car. That has to be low latency because um, you cannot have a someone controlling a car and have a you know 0.4 millisecond delay or something because that might be um, you know life and death kind of. Um, uh, situation and the same uh, from data coming off the bus to remote operation. If the live stream camera feed of what the remote operator is not seeing um, is not in live stream, then that's also going to be a problem. Um, so, like, I, I, I can't answer at a detailed uh, level because this is a very broad uh, question, but I know that there is attempts to do a lot of da data labeling and um, uh, more kind of data analysis about what is critical and what isn't. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I believe Wille has raised his hand. So Wille, please go ahead. Maybe I'll comment to Andrew. I have a, a slightly different opinion here in terms of whether we ever can secure remote operation in terms of, for example, jamming always being possible. So that if we are having wireless connections, it's always possible to physically jam that connection close to the car. And there's not much we can do. So I think that most of the architectures have to rely on some kind of hierarchical safety, meaning that there has to be some physical level of safety uh, uh, that is already, let's say, uh, that the car itself can provide. Uh, it may be only in the level of emergency stop or, or similar functionality that allows the car to basically go to a safe state uh, independently of any external user. And that actually resolves slightly at least the latency concerns, for example, and uh, similar concerns in terms that the 
from the pure safety perspective, I mean, it's not nice if there's a network uh, quality problem and suddenly the car goes to safety stop, but it's not a safety problem. It's a performance problem. It's that the car has to stop down and wait until there is enough network bandwidth, but it's not a safety problem necessarily. Uh, and, and that makes it slightly different, at least from regulation and engineering or safety engineering point of view. So, so from my perspective, actually the, the biggest issues are also in terms of um, in more, more like ensuring that the data that gets into the car in the case of rail mode operation is authentic. And same thing that the data that gets shown as car um, uh, what, what's the view of the car to the remote operator is authentic. So that the remote operator can be sure the data is correct and not spoofed along the way, which is actually a, a different problem uh, from the point of view of, of, of ensuring the quality of service of the network connection. Thanks. Yeah, this is, uh, again, personally, I feel, feel intrigued about this topic and, for example, the redundancy uh, of, of well, you have even just uh, different sensors plus external data that you are utilizing as a system. And at some point, or probably at many points, there are conflicts between these different uh, sensors or data sources, and the system has to make decisions on, on whether to proceed or, like you were saying, to make a safety stop because there's a conflict. And again, human beings, when we are driving uh, a car uh, somewhere, we might get the visibility blocked by, for example, sun shining into our eyes or something like this, in which case we intuitively uh, might reduce the speed or do something or just neglect uh, one of these data sources. So for example, somebody screaming in the, in the back seat, we might be used to uh, blocking that out uh, then again, uh, the control of autonomous vehicles, for example, the, these uh, intuitions are not inbuilt. They, they have to be logical ones, right? And, and for this, this reason, again, the decisions should be more safe than what humans can do because they are more deliberate. Uh, but then again, these sudden instances, uh, they have to be taught to the system first before the system can react in it in a in a logical way right yeah well uh before we wrap up i i, I have a very general perhaps two popularistic questions to everybody involved um uh well as, as, as i said the marketing forces and car industries is is is, is trying to say that just wait some some years and 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 the, the autonomous vehicles will come there and they, then you can be drunk and and drive home safe and 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 all that. Uh, but um, how the do you vehicle will drive? You will not drive. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah for, anyway, so the, 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 but how do you feel as as a specialist and and, and of robotics and 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 well mobility mobility in, from from that uh, perspective? I mean, not just Villa, but everybody uh, involved today. Uh, do you really believe? that that uh, current type of of traffic uh, having pedestrians and and and, and um, well bicycles e scooters cars uh, lorries uh, buses or all that uh, uh, water buses i mean on, on water waterways and all that, that we will have something like that but but the vehicles are are autonomous is it is it i mean if we think history or technology it's it's always afterwards easy to see you know trajectories or, or lines that 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 we wanted to have automobile and then we got automobile and now we are driving automobiles but 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 thinking from now uh, to to the future whatever may happen and and the technology may and the market may may sort of develop in in, in whatever direction so so do do you really believe that we will have future of autonomous vehicles or is this just interesting study that that you are studying and and developing but the reality might be something something else very unclear question but if you have any any reflections please that's a very common question anyway uh, <laughs> get quite often asked uh, to be honest 
but what I believe is actually that uh, the autonomous vehicles are coming anyway. So that's, I, I think there's no question of that. But of course, when is the question. Uh, and we very likely see here like step-by-step -step involvement, not like uh, drastic change, like some car developers are saying uh, or manufacturers that, okay, 2023, there will be like full autonomous vehicle. I don't believe it's gonna happen in that sense, but uh, we, we see rather like uh, continuous developments where the new functions are added time to time to the passenger cars, like those advanced driving assistance systems go better and better over the time. And I also believe that maybe the uh, one of the first um, autonomous vehicles, which really go like, like in, uh, not a full autonomous, but still uh, generally without uh, the human interaction would be really those uh, AV shuttles, the last mile uh, shuttle buses, which are low speed. They are in a specific area. So we can really easily li limit um, the different aspects which might be do very difficult to solve. Like even this uh, performance and safety questions. Uh, so we can even go in the way that we put them in some factory area which is very well defined. There are some people are maybe walking only. And, and in that case, uh, it's not that difficult to really deploy because technically things are, uh, let's say sounds quite uh, solved in general, but if you want to really put them into the real traffic, there are millions of aspects you're really struggling and, and all these details we have to solve so uh, giving us so complex uh, environment so that it probably is not coming um, so fast that we see in real traffic environment uh, the full autonomous vehicles uh, uh, that soon. And also the, the social aspects I think is coming more and more important. For example, if you like also Willem mentioned that if you want that the vehicle will follow all the traffic rules, but we have to put let's say the safety shuttles uh, into the operation and I don't know in Vietnam or some Asia where you you know how the traffic looks like. And, and if the vehicle will follow all the traffic rules, it's never <laughs> able to start driving even because no one gives the road. Uh, and, um, and if the vehicle is very polite, then just can't drive. Uh, it also means that we really need to educate people, familiarize them with the self-driving vehicles. Uh, and, and to start with those small mini passes, I think it's the, the kind of uh, best option. So we can go step by step, uh, uh, into the full autonomous vehicles, which is coming at some point, but they are very likely like uh, step by step and not that fast as many, many manufacturers are saying. Thank you, Raivo. And maybe let's give the uh, last word briefly to Ville. Maybe a quick comment on that. Ahead. So uh, there is a, the question whether we need or whether we will have autonomous cars. I guess the first, Part of the question is actually, do we expect the mobility needs of people to change? I think that since the beginning, oh, for the last hundred years or and more than that, we've had needs to move around in order to, uh, since people have been going to work, for example. So there is a need. There are also other re reasons for people to move around. But if we need to have personal mobility, we need some solutions for those. And the big question is, if those needs change, then, of course, that would revolutionize all transport. But I don't see that happening, at least on the short term. We, have, we are still living in a physical world where physical goods need to move. There are many things that we, in addition to us, I, I don't think that we will be staying inside our own homes uh, for, forever. Uh, even though with the, with the current situation with the pandemic, we have seen that it's more possible than maybe we thought. But it's not possible for everyone. And it's not, we will still need mobility. Uh, and people need to be able to move around. Uh, so if that doesn't change, I think that, that we have seen that from the technological point of view, we've seen already great autonomy in more constrained tra uh, transport environments like trains and metro trains. So we already know that they can be incredibly safe, much safer than human uh, operated ones. Uh, for, the, and for, for the personal vehicles or, or goods vehicles, we will see similar things happening. 
as Raivo said, I think the important thing is that this won't happen overnight. It will be a gradual change uh, where easiest cases will be done first. So we won't, I don't expect that uh, during my work career where there's at least 20 years left still, I see, I will be able to have a autonomous car take me to a summer cottage somewhere on the end of a very bad road where there's no 3D model. We won't expect the same level of infrastructure that we have in the in the in a city. But on the other hand, I do expect to see them in cities, certainly in in uh, limited roles within particular operation design domains. This term ODD that has appeared several times is the uh, acronym for operational design domain. So that's a place where a certain system can operate. And certainly, I do expect to see them in cities in certain design domains. The other part, which is, is uh, where it's very likely that we will see them is highway driving when we are talking only about the highway part of the driving. Uh, I do expect uh, that we will see them in the next uh, 10 to 20 years in full, auto full autonomy within that day domain. Thank you, Vila. I think this is a really good yeah. st statement to conclude mm -hmm. this session. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, ho hold you to your word and come back in 20 years to see if you were <laughs> right or not at the same uh, research and innovation seminar. I don't know exactly what volume it will be, but uh, we will be definitely having this for another 20 years at least. Yeah, yeah. But the next recession will be will be dealing with uh, green twins, uh, this this uh, digital twins of, of, of plantation. They also have very strong emphasis on on participatory urban planning, and and we will we will we will follow that that line of of, of the large scale pilot. Next time it will be January, early early February. We don't have the date yet, but you will hear. Yeah. So please follow us. follow our Twitter and uh, the YouTube channel, of course, they have been linked in the chat and, and we will let you know when the next recession is ready. And uh, thank you for all uh, presenters and panelists for your yeah. discussion also Extra for the audience. Extra thank you for, for Rivercell who, who you know, had all these contacts and, and ideas and yeah. we are great organizers, but we couldn't do this aloud, definitely. And Michel, studio director and, and Anne Lu, uh, communications manager from Finnish Center. We, we have the four, four, four person team producing these with sessions. So thank you for us. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank see you. See you next time. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye.